Welcome to Tales from the Tables with your hosts, Rob Bradley, John Charles Ceccarelli, and James Burroughs. Yes, hello and welcome to episode 16 of Tales from the Tables. Sixteen. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot yeah. of weeks. Lot of that, that is a lot of weeks. That's a heck of a lot of weeks, isn't it? We're June. We're, we're June. <laughs> we're, ju- we're in June. We're June. Happy we're summer, joined, everybody. We're joined. <laughs> we're joined today in today's podcast by Jack Price. Hi, Jack. Hello. Yeah, Jack's one of our esteemed Roldark dungeon masters. We brought him on to have a little chat. Yes, indeed. This is exciting. Very ominous that does. This suddenly yes. feels like it just became a like a job interview type scene. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, a little chat. Very yes. feels, for you. Yes, it feels very mafioso. <laughs> yeah, Listen, Jack, you come here on our podcast on the day of episode sixteen. All right, we're gonna we're gonna have to make you an offer you can't refuse. All right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's gonna get a light down on you. Yeah, face here. Get some from screws in. You know the usual things. Right. <laughs> how you guys? How you guys doing, James? You had a good week. So yeah, far? yeah, yeah. Great week. Great week so yeah. far. Um, yeah, I've got a got a job interview tomorrow. Um, another, one. another one. Okay. Yeah, you, you love you love interviews, don't you? you well, like it's a, <laughs> well, last you one was interview every week. <laughs> the last one was for an external position. This one is for an internal promotion. So, right, oh, we'll wow. see how that see how that rolls. Um, yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, oh, wow. so I've yeah, got an interview here. tonight, and then I'm doing interview prep immediately after, and then I've got to be in Cambridge at nine a.m. for an Ooh. interview. So oh, that will mean I have to get up around five. And uh, Jade's probably listening to this, and it's like, so that's a, that's the time I get up every day for work. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, yeah, right. Or JC for this podcast, for example. Yeah, yes. basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, um, well, best of luck, James. I uh, I actually have a bit of a phobia with with interviews because um, I went through a few stages when I was living in London where I literally would have like. I'd be interviewing every day because like the recruitment agencies in London will just literally throw like interviews at you constantly. And you're just like, mm. okay, yeah, cool. I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. And for some bizarre reason, I don't know what it is, but whenever I have an interview, I always need a poo. <laughs> literally, <laughs> literally, <laughs> literally I walk in and I'm <laughs> busting for a shit. And I'm just like, right. and all I can think about it's the fact that I really having need to go. Yeah. <laughs> having to go. You know, it's all these questions. I'm like, uh huh. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're like, do well, you have yes, any questions well, for us? You're like, yes. Well, where is the where nearest is restroom? It's, it's all where, where's your toilet? And, uh, yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, like, like, I know, I know that as soon as I get, if I went for one beforehand, like, like I, I'm sat there, nothing's happening, nothing's yeah. happening. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, I don't need to go. But maybe this is maybe this is the one time I have an interview where I don't actually need to go for a poo. So I go, cool, okay, great. So I go to the interview, and lo and behold, I'll be sat there waiting for the person to arrive who's going to interview me, and it will just suddenly be like, you need a poo. And I'm like, oh, oh god damn it. Your body hates you. Yeah, it does. It's just like out to get me. Maybe the fear to... poo is a is a social mechanic that we need to write into some some D and D rules. I know, seriously, <laughs> yeah, right? right. Yeah. Like your character approaches the big bad evil guy and suddenly feels the need to poo. <laughs> yeah. Roll a con it, save. Yeah. Disadvantage on, on any yeah, charisma right. checks as you squirm uncom- uncomfortably <laughs> as you try to walk away. Was that a sweaty fart? Mm. Oh. <laughs> oh. Sorry, sorry. You leave sorry. that behind for the sorry. interviewers that you didn't like for the jobs so that you're like. I actually don't want this because yeah, I exactly. want to go to one of the other six I had this week. So <laughs> that's yeah, if right. interviews every single day. That's a very uncomfortable week. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's horrible. It's horrible. Gosh. Yeah. How, how was your week, JC? My week was good. Um, nothing particular of note. A lot of games this this mm. week. Um, had a couple of one shots. Had uh, obviously another Spectarium game earlier this week. They are officially in the Feywild and exploring around. Um, yeah, it's been going yeah. pretty well. Nothing, nothing of otherwise particular note. I did not get out to the Renaissance Fair, rather sadly. So, um, which I know it, you, you return listeners that were extremely invested in my social life, um, yeah. in my nerdy social life. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to get to one of the other ones in one of the other states that are a little bit later in the year. So, 
but that's okay. it. Yeah, nothing, nothing of note. Uh, I'm in. I'm still playing VG three uh, when I can. Yeah. Not not a lot of it actually. This week has been rather busy with family stuff, but um, I am in Act three. So uh, there's Act that. Three. Finally, yeah, so, you'll probably so, catch up with me soon because I've, uh, I've not had a chance to get back through much of it. Mm. Yeah, same as you. Have, you, yeah. have either of you completed it yet? No. Nope. No. Nope. Nope. Okay. I'm taking I, my sweet I, time. I don't even. I think I must be like Act Zero. I'm like literally. <laughs> I'm literally like just wandering around that bloody thing, trying to think like, how the hell do you kill that freaking witch? I'm just like, oh, um, oh right, right, just right. Wandering around like a moron. <laughs> do what I did. Come back to it real late. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do okay. make it one of the last things you do for that act or something, mm. right? Okay. How about you, Jack? Have you have you played this game? Yeah. I am literally act zero in that it's installed and ready to ah, go, but I'm, I'm waiting until I can take a, a couple of weeks off because I know exactly yeah. what I'm like. And the moment I start, that's it. Everything else mm-hmm. in my life is pushed to the side. Yep. That's my fear as well. I know that like, you know, it's like I'm, I'm waiting for those little windows when Charlotte, my partner's like, like, okay, I'm just going to go out shopping. I'll see you later. And I'll be like, yeah, no worries. Bye. See you in, see you in a bit. What time you'll be back? Oh, about seven. Oh, okay, cool. I'm watch this five. I'm like, great. And then she's literally just as, just as she's about to leave the door, she goes, do you mind doing the hoovering and putting the tea on? And mm. do you mind doing this? And do you mind doing that while I'm out? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, no worries. And literally the door closes. I'm like running around, hoovering like mad. I've got the oven on. And I'm like, right. And I, like, go, I go to sit down. I pick up a steam deck and it's like 10 to 7. Yeah, you're like, no! <laughs> no! At least, ten minutes. at least you're the smart one to have done it beforehand. I would have been like, yeah, you're going to be back at seven and I have to hoover and, and do the laundry and stuff. All right. I can probably I can save that, that for the hour. last half hour. Yeah. yeah. I'll just, I'll just jump on BG three now and, and, and try and stop at six thirty, so I can have yeah, enough time to, nope, never, never I know works I, out. I know I wouldn't. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know yeah. I wouldn't. So well, I've, I've got this. Like, have you? Yeah, right. I've got this weird thing going on where, well, this is kind of how I'm with video games in general. If I really like a game, I don't want it to end. So I will start getting closer to the end and start stalling more. And I actually, I just did this with Breath, not Breath of the Wild, um, Tears of the Kingdom, the Zelda game that came out for the Switch. And I haven't actually beaten it. I, I did, I think I poured like at least over 100 hours. I did so many side quests. I've done most of everything you can do in Hyrule at this point, except for the Korok seeds, because I'm not doing that again. And I just, I, I didn't go for Ganon. And I was like, because I wanted to live forever. I don't want this experience to feel like it's closed. So yeah, that's right. kind of what I'm doing with BG3 right now. And I'm like, I, I just have to push through and, Remember that I can do a second playthrough where I can go do all the stuff that I didn't do, like Romans Carlac and stuff like that. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> How's I'll your get week, there. Jack? Good? Good week, yeah, Jack? Yeah, it's a good week. It was my birthday last week, last Wednesday. Oh, hey, oh, happy belated. Happy birthday. Thank you very much. So, yeah, Lib- a Libra. Libra, yeah. Mm. Very balanced, apparently. Yeah. And indecisive <laughs> as well, apparently. That sounds, sounds very right. <laughs> <laughs> or does it? Oh, I don't know. I'm yeah, hmm. I'm sure. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah, I got to went home for a few days. Um, I usually play my my home game that's been running for years and years. Everybody's kind of moved off around the country, so we usually play online. But we all managed to actually get into the same room as each other and, and have oh, a pretty great. long-winded, oh, nice. epic nice. session. Are these are these the guys that booked onto the last roll-up fest? Yes, two of them uh, are are coming. Oh, to rock on! Fest. Are they, they on your, nice, you? They were nice guys. They were good guys. That's I'm assuming they're at your table. Yes, yeah, there were yes, three of them sweet. at the last one, and then two of and them at this one. Um, so they're coming up. Oh, cool. yeah, they're, they're, all, they're always up for it. Whenever there's a hey, do you want to come to a cool place and play some D and D? It's like ah, yes. Where do I sign up? Yeah, right. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it is sick, isn't it? Right on. Well, you know what? We always get asked how our weeks were, and we never ask Rob how his week was. So, Rob, how was your week? <laughs> Uh, yeah, Did you so do right, anything birth- special or important this week? Well, week? it was my birthday on Sunday. Actually. Hey! Which is why we're in Libra Tech. So, yeah. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't me like, being like amazing at Horror Stone. <laughs> 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 it's like, like whoa, Libra! <laughs> it's, 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 it's as well. I know, no, I, no, it's pretty cool. We, um, what did we do? What did I do? I think, oh, that's right. Um, Charlotte's parents came down and we went out for a meal, which was lovely. Nice. Um, which is cool. And then this week so far, uh, I played Train Simulator 4 the other day for about an hour. <laughs> um, yeah, I was going up the um, I was going up the line between uh, Peterborough and Doncaster. That was fun. I dropped off a few passengers, picked a few passengers up. 
and then uh... add it to the gallery. <laughs> yeah. it's on, it's on. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, so right. if you ever are looking for yet another job to add to your amazing repertoire, you could always just be a train conductor. Yeah, I could. Yeah, I totally yeah. could. Yeah. It's the, Although, the, game, the game really teaches you as well. It's, it's like teaches you everything you need to know about how nice. to drive a train. That's amazing. <laughs> Honestly, I'm such I'm such a freaking nerd when it comes to stuff like that. Like, I, <laughs> like like any kind of any kind of job simulation game. Like hmm. What it is, it's like it's like I just want to do it. I'm like I'm like yeah, I really want to do a boring mundane job. Oh, you're gonna get <laughs> simulate, simulate. You're gonna get farming simulator. I think I think farming simulator. simulator. I've, got it, I've got it. Play got it. it. Play it. <laughs> Farming simulator, love it. <laughs> Flight simulator, love it. Mm-hmm. Train, train simulator, simulator, love it. I keep looking at I keep looking at lawnmower simulator, and I'm like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lawnmower there's, simulator. There's, yeah, there's there's, oh, power, no. there's power there's power wash simulator. Yeah, power, I mean, that power looks really satisfying. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> what's that about? Power That's wash. incredible. I'll, I'll 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 watch it. I'll I'll power wash. I would love to get all you all the shit. A New York City taxi simulator, so that you're kind of like. Well, actually, in reality, exactly. There's a button dedicated to like, "Hey, I'm walking here" or something, right? Um, But there's, in truth, if it was a true simulator, all you would do is just sit there doing nothing because of the traffic. Well, there there is, there is, there is a driving, a driving simulator, which is literally all you're doing is just driving a car through a town. (laughs) <laughs> you're stopping at the traffic There's nothing lights. else you're in a game it's not a race of any kind you're going round and round about <laughs> it's, it's literally nothing it's, it's just literally that is all you're doing oh my that's god it. that's it honestly the only you wait you wait in the next in the next 20 20 years <laughs> the next 20 years there'll be a simulator for every single mundane thing you can think of there'll oh be, i'm sure there'll be dad simulator there'll be baby <laughs> babysitting simulator Babysitting simulator. That's great. You just watch TV and check in on the kid yeah. every every half an hour, right? Yeah, it's yeah. not. It's fine. It's not. Yeah. Nothing bad can happen to it. It's a game. Right. Right. Yeah. There is no stakes here. The <laughs> only the only simulator game I've ever played was uh, Goat Simulator. You guys know oh, the yeah. one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there Class. you go. I mean, Goat Simulator for God's sakes. Like. Yeah, but but that one is that one is kind of it's got great. its own fame because of how ridiculous yeah. it is and how they left all the bugs yeah. in and said they're not bugs, they're features. <laughs> yeah. Right. Really, really funny. I think City Skylines Two comes out in this end of this month. I'm probably gonna buy that. As well, yeah. Because I like I like a city builder. Nice. Yeah, I love all that stuff. So yeah, so that's basically been my week. Um, what else nice. did I do? I'm sure I did. Did you get anything good for your birthday? Um, Charlotte's mum and dad put a fifty quid note in my card, and in, when I opened it in front of them, I was like, it fell out, and I was like, whoa, what the hell's this? <laughs> Ooh, I, was like, I don't, don't see one <laughs> of these. Monopoly money. <laughs> 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 I was like, wow. Yeah. It is like monopoly so, money. You guys, you, your currency is so colorful. Yeah. Ours in the U.S. is just green and usually faded and old and hard yeah. and wrinkly by the time you get it. So you're like, <laughs> I also got a load of cloves, a load of squishy presents, which, um, you know, if I was to like go back in time and tell my ten-year-old self, you'd have been livid. Like all these, all these soft presents, I want things in boxes. <laughs> like, you know, really good ones, they're the toys. Oh, yeah, so I, I got, so I got like, not that I'm being ungrateful because Charlotte listens to this. Not being ungrateful, Charlotte. It's like literally oh. um, warm, like a big this big warm shirt with like buttons because I'm doing I do farmers markets now on Saturday morning where I sell my coffee. Yeah. Yes. So like, so I'm doing that, which is great. Um, coffee simulator. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, would be cool. that would be interesting because it is it is i do i love it i love roasting coffee it's brilliant it's like uh it's very similar to making dice i love mm. that whole like artisan process yeah of, like yeah. creating something and you have to like go through like a stage i think i said the last one i last podcast i said i'm really into like logistics yeah i'm yeah. so I'm such a weirdo <laughs> yeah. I have to agree with you on the on the soft present thing but i think and i know that i'm in the minority here but i don't like receiving socks as a uh, main present cop out at, at christmas so you like, are if, not if, 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 like if, yeah. if it, like someone's like oh i found you some nice socks and i got you this other thing i'm like oh that's nice and i'll yeah. absolutely wear the socks and i'll use them yeah. and i'll love them but yeah. if you just get socks i'm like well I could buy myself socks, like if I'm in that dire need of socks. <laughs> do you, do you want to buy yourself socks? That's, That's the thing. thing. Yeah, I was going right. to say that. Yeah. I'm yeah. more I'm likely. The, I think I'm in the opposite side of it, where I, I bank <laughs> on getting socks yeah, at me Christmas. Too. Right. So all right. through I... the year, it's just no, I don't need those. By I September, need I need holes. people to get me clothes <laughs> yeah. because yeah, I will not, not spend this. money myself on clothes. So it'll be. Exact, there was I'm a exact... point in my life. 
where I was like, no, please don't give me clothing. I want toys and games and stuff. Right. But now I'm like, actually, I, I could really use a couple of extra shirts or, or a good pair of yeah. nerdy socks. That, that'd be okay. Yeah. I'm, they I'm have always... like little triforces on them. That's all right. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. I'm always just buy anything that I want. I just buy myself mm -hmm. and all the mm -hmm. things that I need. I'm just like, yeah, just get me that for Christmas and my birthday. Yeah. Like the problem I have is at Christmas getting Christmas themed socks. Because mm. by the time you receive them on Christmas Day, you can wear them for maybe half a week. week. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And then so you're like, well, great. So I've got some socks, but I can't use them yeah. for most of the year. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. And then you forget about them for the next year. And yeah. then you're like, oh, the next right. year, with the next year, you get some new ones that you'll then have to wear because otherwise you <laughs> seem ungrateful for. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. I am a strong supporter of Christmas socks in the summertime. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. But then, Gingerbread but then, like, cookies, like, like, if you get fluffy, thick, woolen <laughs> socks, yes, yeah, then, yes, yes, yes. then you, you take them off at the end of the day and your feet are just, oh, that's horrible. Oh, <laughs> there's some, there's, there's some that like, can't be done with. All right, noted all of you listeners that are trying to, you know, ingratiate yourselves with us by getting us Christmas presents, don't get James any fluffy socks. He's got enough yeah, right. going on. He's well, got I, got I bought myself going on. slipper socks after uh, Jade Ooh. introduced me to, to them. Because she has loads socks? of pairs slipper socks, so they're like uh, big, thick socks um, that yeah. have like uh, grippy feet on the bottom, so mm. that yeah. they they don't slip like regular socks. If you've got hard floors, everywhere. yeah. So you wear them so like you, slippers. You wear them okay. like slippers, um, and your feet and your feet stay really toasty. I guess. Yeah, they're so toasty. Oh well, okay. they're the toastiest okay. feet. The toastiest okay. feet. Okay. Yeah, this is a D and D slipper podcast. Socks. <laughs> yeah. Slipper socks. I'm gonna put that down on my little list because that's a that's a good one for for gifts, isn't it? Slipper socks. Uh, they are, yeah, they they do make good gifts as well. Yeah, slipper socks. Mm. Okay, cool. I remember that. Nice one. So, James, any RPG news this week? I'm sure there is some. Yes, uh, we've got we've got a little bit. Um, so Pathfinder remastered previews um have been coming out. Really? Um, so there is a core preview file. Um, there's some changes they've been making. So, for instance, spell level is now spell rank. Um, right. They've removed spell schools entirely. Um, and there is apparently a new spell format that I've not really quite managed to get my head around. I'm not a Pathfinder player, so glancing over it has not really uh, <laughs> imbued much knowledge. <laughs> upon they've, remo me. they've removed spell schools. What, as in, like, they like. Abjuration, like conjuration. And... Yes, yeah, so yeah. they're no longer spell no. schools. So it's just... why, why, why do you think they've done that? simplification probably yeah yeah um, which is weird because pathfinders you is being sort of the more complicated yeah. right um, right. But that's always been this, that's always been the stellar be... pathfinder isn't it there's yeah. the complicated yeah. version of the D, D deep dive well it's a more number right. crunchy version yeah. it might be that they've replaced I've played pathfinder if, if anything sometimes it's actually feels like it's simpler like mm -hmm. 5e sure streamlines it a lot and and pathfinder does have a lot more number crunch because things give you actual numerical bonuses or or mm. penalties rather than advantage and disadvantage being kind of king and queen. Um, but all the same, their, their action system is brilliant. Like you can basically, instead of having like an action and then a bonus action and your movement, you just effectively have three things that you can do on your turn and you can, and those three consider them points. Those three points can be spent interchangeably. You want to attack three times. That's all three. If you want to move, attack, and move, that's three. If you want to cast a spell and move, that's depending on the level of the spell or now the rank of the spell, that takes up certain amounts of points. Like you can upgrade your spell and consume more actions that way. So yeah, I, I think it makes a lot of sense because a lot of times you, people don't have to move and all they do is like, okay, I swing once and I'm done. It well, does seem. You can swing three times. Yeah, I love that three action that they've got. I play a little bit of Starfinder from time mm -hmm. to time, and oh, yeah. when you get new people playing it, they're like sometimes combat can slow right down if there's new players. But the three actions is so easy to explain that it makes you know for a system that is far crunchier than Five E, it becomes really simple to just drop into combat and be like, okay, cool, I can do this, this, this. Yeah, great. What order do I want to do them in? Let's go. Yeah, it does seem like they are trying to streamline it because they've got rid of spell components as well. Yeah. Um, so and That's sad because they've removed the spell classes. I think what they're saying is that they won't need to track different proficiencies for each tradition of spells. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you just use the highest proficiency that you have uh, and lets those attributes do all the heavy lifting there. 
Um, damaging cantrips will now only use damage dice rather than adding an attribute modifier, so you don't need to Ooh. work that out anymore. Weird. Um, so I imagine they've upped the damage dice um, to make up for removing a modifier. Um, mm-hmm. And focus spells, so with longer casting times, have had their casting times reduced, so you can use them in the middle of encounters more easily. Interesting. Oh, okay. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, cool. I I always feel bad when revisions come out that cut flavor. Things like spell mm. schools and and mm. components. I I love that kind of stuff. It's yeah. It, it, a lot of people ignore it, but. I think you can have a lot of fun with it. Sometimes you're trying to keep the game moving and you forget about components altogether. But I mean, it can be a lot of fun if, you know, you, for instance, I have a rule in my games where if you want to, I kind of modify how counter spell works for 5e. And I'm saying, I, I say you need to be able to see them using components and then you need to roll an arcana check to determine what kind of spell it is before you go about trying to cancel it. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. I I'll describe maybe you know if it's if it's a component based spell you see them digging into their pouch as they pull out a small sphere you have a hard time seeing what it is but then you notice that it's what looks like guano and they're like oh no they're casting fireball you know that kind of thing. oh well yeah exactly yeah, yeah, it definitely gives like a, a more of a narrative to um, the idea of what spells are by having mm-hmm. their own school you know it just gives them that level of depth. Yeah, you know, it's like because because I guess in a way you know magic doesn't really get explained too much in Dungeons and Dragons like where where it comes where it comes from who was the first person who ever like harnessed it and how and why and you know what I mean whereas like the right. schools of magic has like, it gives you that sort of in on like some kind of history and some kind of you know association to it. It's a shame that they'd they'd want to get rid of it. In power. Yeah, I hope, I hope yeah. They, I hope they don't. I hope that doesn't. I hope they don't copy it in D and D and do it the same with the new one. Bring it what I don't because there's spells like um, detect magic that it gives you this this school of spell that you are detecting. Yeah. So if you're trying to detect traps, you can sort of be like, oh, is it an illusion? Is it mm-hmm. something that's going to be evocation? Is it necromancy? Is it, is it necromancy? Yeah, evocation? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't know how they're going to work around stuff like that. I guess if you were to do, I don't know what the version of detect magic is in is like in pathfinder but presumably it was relatively similar hmm. now are you just going to detect are you going to a room you use detect magic yeah there's magic there it's yeah, a little right. bit less interesting isn't it like it, it is. it's a little yeah. less thematic and yeah. but i don't know i imagine maybe that there is more to this than we're seeing right now mm. so okay Mm. Uh, Ooh, actually they... you know what i pulled it up uh detect magic in pathfinder which is the name of its spell mm-hmm. is actually pretty interesting it's a cone shaped emanation meaning it's effectively where you're facing right yeah it's a range of 60 feet and here's how this one works you detect magical auras the amount of information revealed depends on how long you study a particular area or subject if you do it for one round you just notice the presence or absence of magical auras on a second round, you note the number of different magical auras and power of the most potent aura. And then on the third round, the strength and location of each aura. And if the items or creatures bearing the auras are in line of sight, you can make arcana checks to determine the school of magic involved in each one. Right. Um, yeah. So that actually gives you a lot more information than... And it, and it keeps going. There's like tables to this and there's a detect magic comma greater version of the okay, spell yeah. as well. So yeah. It's a so lot more involved. So, what are okay. the auras exactly? Are they? Do they? And if they're detecting different types of auras, are they different schools of magic auras? Or are they... yeah, yeah. So they have different kinds of uh, schools of uh, magic. I don't remember them off the top of my head, but I know that they're relatively similar to D anD D, or were, I guess, since they're yeah, yeah, yeah. going so away. Not, so they're going to have to change that whole spell, aren't they? I guess then. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they've believe. announced the core race, a uh, core ancestry. Sorry. They are not using uh, the word races or species. They've gone for ancestries. Um, right. So dwarves, elves, gnome, goblin, halfling, human, leshy, and orc. Um, leshy, if I'm correct, is some is it like a dryad type forest? Yeah, it depends on the myth, but that's where leshen from the Witcher comes from. So yeah. it's, it's a spirit of the forest. Sometimes it's a malevolent one. Sometimes it's like a yeah, more of a dryad sort of type. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I've actually okay. mostly seen it as as leshy. I've mostly seen it as this sort of large green tree like bearded mm. man. 
Um, I know I've seen that in a couple of different yeah. games before. Like a nymph? Oh. Um, kind of, but usually even greener <laughs> and bigger. Oh, okay. yeah. I was sure Pathfinder had its own version of tieflings. Do they not? Mm. Uh, this there's not listed on the core in the core the new core rulebook. Oh. Mm. Okay. So um. Yeah, versatile heritages, so extra options of mixed ancestries between those and extra planar origins. Uh, characters can only have one heritage and one lineage feat, but that doesn't mean that other bloodlines don't show up in an interesting ways in their DNA. So that sounds cool. Um, I don't know exactly how that's going to play out, though. But uh, I mean, it certainly seems interesting if you can take, be a half, half dwarf, half elf, or half gnome half fleshy or whatever half dwarf <laughs> half giant and just come out as a normal man yes yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. that's the combination we're looking for um <laughs> yeah i'm a human but i'm not <laughs> <laughs> mm. um cool. and there is some starfinder uh, stuff as well uh Ooh. they've done a field test for starfinder second edition um that is live and the first five levels of the mystic class um, along with a few new spa, uh, Starfinder 2E spells um, have been released. So apparently the Mystic is a class that relies on its connections and forming bonds with fellow party members, uh, and the connections help customize how they use their vitality network, um, which it looks like allows them to be powerful healers. They're, they seem to be cleric-y type characters, um, which I, you can see when you go with a Mystic that's got a cleric-y monk type vibe. Um, to the description there mm. um, yeah they can be connected to deities but they won't be required to worship deities so there's some w wiggle room there if you want to play a, a, a sort of cleric -y type healer that doesn't actually need to learn a load of stuff about a religion to get into character cool what's, what's Starfinder like is it um, what kind of obviously I'm guessing the setting is space but what type of space setting is it is it quite it's cartoony space or is it it's fantasy space isn't it so it's um, yeah yeah I think jack the, you probably know more than i do the the universe setup of it is I, if i remember rightly the the planet that pathfinder is set on yeah um if you fast forward like a few thousand years into the future that planet has gone missing oh wow um, Ooh, and there's been this cool. arrival of these kind of like techno gods and a few other little interesting things that have happened so you'll still find the core Pathfinder races or ancestry as they are now around the, the different planets, but they'll right. be in kind of small clusters and small colonies that still remember you know, the old ways and the good old days. And then there's planets entirely for androids and robotics. So across their solar system, yeah. there's kind of a little bit of everything. So like whatever flavor of sci-fi yeah. you might want. <laughs> like, okay, cool. We're over here now. Let's do that bit. Right. So there's fantasy space sci-fi, there's futuristic sci-fi, there's like probably war sci-fi, like more yeah, Warhammer absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. There's there's what, whatever you're looking for, they've they've got a planet with it on somewhere. <laughs> Fair. Right. Fair. Cool. Nice. There's the benefits of sci-fi where you can just be like, ah, oh, yeah, we'll have a planet where we want to do this one specific thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sick. Oh. Cool. Any more news, James? Uh yes, yeah, so I've got a couple of bits. Um so nice. uh this is something that you might be interested in, Rob, especially with your uh, love for um, Thousand Year Vampire. Uh, D&D Simulator. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can simulate, you simulate being a DM. Yeah. <laughs> it's That's a lot of prep work. <laughs> you're, just, you're just there with writer's block most of the time. You can't really interact with the game at all. You, and keys you press doesn't do anything because your character in the simulator doesn't have any ideas. Just yeah. sitting there. <laughs> it's writer's block the simulator. Um, yeah. <laughs> brilliant. Okay, so uh there is uh the Star Trek um game, which I know you've also run, Rob, um, mm -hmm. Adventures, is releasing a solo RPG captain's log book. Oh um, wow, so, that's a good idea. Yeah, so you'll be able to play through your own captain's log. Uh this particular entry uh, that they're releasing oh, wow. is three hundred and twenty six page full color standalone digest sized rule book. Whoa. Is, awesome. is, I know big <laughs> designed Whoa. to give players completely streamlined version of the 2d20 system used in the primary game only you can do this as a single person essentially giving you the chance to build your own star trek stories with you as captain in an adventure that you can take on by yourself right um, so it's like more? thousand year old vampire but you're the captain of yeah of, but uh, you can do it 
you can get one of four versions. So they will the cover will reflect whether it, it well, each with their own individual covers, obviously. So that mm-hmm. will reflect whether it's the original series, the next generation, Deep Space Nine, and Vo- slash Voyager, or the Discovery era of the franchise. So there's four versions of it as well. So if you wanted Amazing. to, cool. there's nice. four different adventures to play through. Very that's, cool. That's eras. really really sick. Mm, um, we know what Rob's getting for Christmas. Get myself one of that. I'm definitely getting that <laughs> for himself. Yeah. Right, right, Damn right. Straight. <laughs> nerd out. And nerd out is a yeah. That'd be uh, sick. So that's a full, and that's forty dollars, which is the same price as any of the D and D rule books, except three times the pages almost. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. I mean, I'm sure they're leaving out a couple of series there. I feel like those are the most popular. But what happened to um? Nobody likes the Enterprise era, as in not not the original, but like the 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 what is it the two early two thousands yeah, Enterprise yeah. show. It's Nobody a, liked it. <laughs> it's a, it's a tricky one because because JJ Abrams pretty much rewrote the whole of that like that that like era almost by changing oh. so much like with uh, Captain Archer and all that shit. Right, it's like, right. It was. They they really they really because their ratings dropped so massively hmm. um, when they were when they were making it. It's a real shame because it because it had it had like a really good premise, but it wasn't quite landing as well as it would because you basically went from like the original, um, obviously the original Star Trek, and yep. then you went to the films with right. that original crew with Kurt as the with with Captain Kirk as the captain, and obviously that was like their their sort of like. Fe- their version of the federation was very loosely like the rules were obviously the rules but they weren't they didn't really find they didn't really follow the rules in a very sort of stringent way and then when next generation came out captain picard was like all about the rules it was mm-hmm. very very serious you know next generation like really sat apart and when you had those two films those two captains come together in generations it was like oh yeah you could really see the difference right and then with Cap- when with captain archer came out with the with enterprise it was like there was like no rules and everyone was just like gun ho and and humans were like really like like naive about like you know like races and things even though that they dealt with having you know if like earth has like different types of like people mm. on there and you would have thought they would learn their lesson by now and yet they don't and it's like it's a bit like uh, it, it really jarred with with like the direction of where it was going to right. then go back but not to just go back. back but then back again you know? yeah. Was it was it meant to be a pre- prequel? Like this was before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, yeah it, was, it, was, it was literally right before Kirk. So it was, okay, like, it, was right. like, it was like maybe like I don't know, two, two or three captains before Kirk. Got it. Got it. Yeah. yeah. So when they were making their initial voyages and kind of meeting yeah. other races for the first yeah. time and stuff. Exactly. Like dealing with the Vulcans and dealing right. with like like they had like a Vulcan science officer on board that would like you know talk to them about and it was always about like you know oh you need to be you need to understand like you know there's different cultures have different ways of dealing with things and it was just a bit like we all, we already know all of this because we're human mm, beings on yeah. earth it's like right. why would we why would we go into space as so naive about that yeah. like it just it just it just jarred too much it jarred and i think yeah. it doesn't really jive with roddenberry's sort of vision of like being a accepting yeah. forward thinking and progressive sort of exploratory yeah. series right exactly yeah. exactly yeah that's those are the problems that we had solved on earth which is right. why <laughs> which is why <laughs> star trek was yeah. made in the first place right yeah right, exactly right. exactly nice. exactly what about the uh what about the car- not the original cartoon but like the new cartoons the um... oh, below decks yeah below decks things. that's the one i've I heard funny things serious. i heard it's actually yeah, i heard it's pretty tongue it is it is really yeah. fun yeah it's really <laughs> funny They've crossed over into live action some of the characters now as well yeah they have oh, really yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in the strange new worlds yeah strange new worlds yeah, that is something that I am refusing to pay for another subscription service oh, to watch. Oh, I know. But it actually know. looks good. Wait, what is <laughs> it on? It's, it's Paramount. on Paramount. Paramount on, on, oh, Paramount Plus. In, in the UK, we have Amazon Prime. Then Amazon Prime's got MGM, Paramount, and <laughs> uh, what else? Hulu, is it? Or yeah, I think. I think so. But you have to then pay extra for those on top of the Amazon that's Prime so, one. So silly. Oh, it's, do you have Stars? Maybe Stars is the oh, other that, one that Amazon has. That's, that's on Disney. That's yeah, on Disney. Oh, that's on Disney now. Oh my yeah, that's god, that's weird. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. I had Stars through Amazon, but yeah, it's so stupid that you're paying for Amazon, then you need to pay more for access to the other other ones. Come on, people. It's. it's I mean, watch no... watch Disney start doing that with their different properties. Like, if you want the Marvel subscription, you have to pay more for that. Or if you oh, want yeah. the the that's animated dumb. subscription, maybe that's part of Disney like normal. But then 
you know, yeah. what National Geographic will now cost you extra and stuff like that. Just watch. They'll, they'll be, they'll they'll be, they'll be totally stupid, do. but they will do it. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, totally, it's, it's totally coming do. back full circle, isn't it? To, you, yep. you, We're you just pay, paying pay for, for DirecTV your, your again. Direct all TV over channel. Yeah. We'll start putting ads in the, in the streaming platforms. Yeah. And it's like, well, did, didn't you you only exist to get rid of these things like isn't that your yeah. purpose yeah. as a streamer yeah but we've we've come back around yeah full circle <laughs> gosh yeah totally it's no. interesting because apparently streaming services do make do make money off the back of advertising but i just don't know how they're doing it it's because I, I don't see adverts when i'm watching it but i guess product yeah, some... placement deals and oh, stuff yeah like maybe that, that. Yeah, I guess right so. yeah i guess it is product placement isn't it? Has to be i knew that, i knew or... all the corona and lord of the rings was <laughs> <Yeah. right. laughs> you, make, you mean though. that starbucks coffee in game of thrones <laughs> was actually <laughs> intentional <laughs> yeah, right. anybody remember right. that that was great yeah. Oh, yeah. Gosh, <laughs> so bad gosh. so bad yeah so bad god do you guys have you guys watched game of thrones do you like game of thrones yes, i do of i used yeah. to anyway I, up until season eight Oh, yeah. But I could I could see More because ones. if you if you watch it you sort of see this this the slow devolving of that show along with the creators of it you know how they used to give those after episode brief interviews and you would see them you could see that they started out as just nerdy fans of the books that were doing their best to make a loyal adaptation and then they slowly got more power hungry and full of themselves as it yep. went on yeah. by the end they were all like you know they it kind of oozed from their characters they you know uh, what was his name mm -hmm. not db weiss whatever his name was would would sit there know. being like oh yeah well you know for this one we kind of saw what the, we, the books were doing and we're like we don't need that. We're going to come up with our own thing. And yeah, like, oh, exactly. It's ooh, a bit, bleh. it's a bit annoying because they they try to do fan service, like similar to what I don't know if you guys have ever watched like um, Neon Genesis Evangelion, which is an anime show that was in. I keep the, hearing the about this. I think you keep telling me yeah, about I this. Yeah, I probably, yeah. yeah. probably, probably do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a bit I'm Jack. I'm a big anime fan, by the way. Let's see my Gunther on the thing. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it's corny. So yeah, it's literally like um. So yeah, basically they when they brought that out in Japan it was a weekly show and people would write in asking for things to be in the show. And the writers would literally just put things in the show that people were asking to see. Mm. And it was like mostly pervy stuff because the Japanese are mental like that. Mm. But, um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it was like, it was all like pervy shit that they wanted. But uh, I think with game of Thrones, they had that in terms of like, like with Jon Snow, certainly they really wanted to like, because because I, I think he should have he should have really died mm, he didn't die interesting and there should there should have been like some kind of like epic sort of showdown between Khaleesi and and the Lannisters that we never really got we never yeah. got Cersei never died got. from falling rocks and I remember everybody oh, was like what <laughs> yeah. that's well, after like, all that after all this yeah I know like, such a such an epic <clears throat> character like those like her, and then and Jamie as well Jamie's character arc was so good it was beautiful and then they like, ruined and then they it. ruined it they just <laughs> shout all over it and you're like why uh, it was, I like Bri Brienne him him and Brienne's like their relationship yeah. like where did that go Yep, that was nowhere. such a beautiful nowhere. relationship, <laughs> and it was and it was a relationship that wasn't romantic as well. So it had that like awesome quality that was so current, and they just yep. destroyed it. Like, what right. has to happen in your in your creative room and your writers' room to go? Okay, let's do a, a final season full of fan service and do stuff that every fan unanimously just hated. Like, how yeah, can right. you go in with yeah, let's give them what they want and then give them nothing at all that they wanted? It makes no sense. Yeah, I don't know. I, I've always suspected maybe it was some sort of unspoken agreement between George R. R. Martin and the showrunners that was like, okay, you can do whatever you want with this character, but this is how he ends up and you have to sort of sign off to this, right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. that seems like a very Martin thing to do, being like, oh, did you did you like where we were going with this? Did you like this <laughs> character? Yeah. Tough shit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. House, but, of the Dragon, House of the Dragon's good, though. I haven't yeah, started watching it. Really I, I I got so badly That's burned by season eight. Uh, no, no, JC, 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 you're in for a treat. It's okay, like right. it's like I, I do intend on giving it Game of Thrones. It's okay. great. Cool. It's, yeah, great. it's the best. The best of Game of Thrones. Even yeah. even the change in actors between when she gets older mm. is like just works. Yeah, they pull it off nice. really well. They did. How's, they did the how's really my boy job. Matt? How's he doing? Yeah, he's doing. Great. Does a good job. Yeah, he's yeah he's in it from the all the way all the way through. He doesn't age um like real life. Uh, no, like real life. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he is a vampire, right? <laughs> but 
I am excited that I'm um, speaking of Matt Smith and, and all that. I, I saw that David Tennant is coming back as the doctor for Doctor Who, and I'm very excited about that. I'll, that means I'd actually probably get back into Doctor Who after not having watched since halfway through Capaldi. So we'll see. I, 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 I really, I, I, love, I love the idea of Doctor Who, but I just don't like what they're doing with it. I just think, mm. it's, I just think they're, they're pushing they're, they're trying to cram in too many different ideas mm. that, make it, that make it a bit that makes it a bit silly. I haven't I, listened. I haven't watched it since, like I said, halfway through Capaldi. So I'm not caught up on anything of what they've been doing with like the last two or three. The, the, the thing that gets me is that they, they, I think they badly cast the doctors so often. Mm. Like Peter Capaldi, really good casting for him. I thought he was perfect. I would have loved to have seen like Jeff Goldblum as the doctor. Like, like he, would have been, he would have been superb. Oh, you, stop you it, Rob. Can you, can no. you imagine? Can you I imagine? Mean, no, <laughs> I mean I can, uh, but oh, I'm sorry, someone, someone, uh, call a, uh, a doctor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Just, this one, be... it's starting up. Yeah, great. Oh wait, I forgot. Goes... I need a quantum spanner. <laughs> yeah, it just it just goes back to like that, like um, like people that are that seem very alien in themselves as actors. Like 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 Christopher Walken would have been I amazing. Say that he'd have been amazing. <laughs> Right? Wow! God! Wow! <laughs> Where are we now? Like, what yeah, is yeah. this place? <laughs> wow! It would have been great. It would have been great. The Daleks. God, two hearts. <laughs> My God! Don't. <laughs> but people. <laughs> by the time he says "don't blink" to people, people have already blinked because yeah. he takes too long. <laughs> Don't blink now. Oh, shit! Yeah. It's too late. <laughs> You get, you get what I'm saying, though, right? Like, Ian McKellen, Ian McKellen would have been pretty good. Oh, that would have been cool. Oh, like, I mean, any, no Ian McKellen, choices. Serene McKellen in anything is cool. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah I can't, can't go wrong with that. We're just, we're just fla flamboyant actors that are already flamboyant. Mm. I think Tilda playing a role Swinton of a character that is flamboyant. Be, right? Yeah, Tinder Swindon would have been good. Tilda Swinton. Oh, just, yeah. yeah. That would have been, yeah, yeah. Yeah. been anyone, awesome. Anyone like that. Right. I, just, I just don't think Jodie Whittaker was, like, a flamboyant person. She was, she was having to act flamboyant. Mm. You know what I mean? Like she, rather than like be had, naturally, which, which is fine, mm -hmm. but you just you just see her. Like she used to live near, she used to live down the road from where me and Charlotte lived in North London, and we used to see oh. her all the time walking, well, a kiss, weird. walking a kiss to school, and we'd be like, "Oh, there's the do there's Doctor Who," and no one noticed her. No one would like pay any attention to her, and I'd be like, "There she is, Doctor Who, just walking down the street." Mm. Like <laughs> Whereas like Peter Capaldi looks like he's like you know. Hello there. Yeah, he's uh, crazy yeah. all the time. He's <laughs> mad, <laughs> angry. Like, he's plugged into the mains. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm a doctor. You know, and and uh, and and what? And I think what's his chops? He's played uh, the guy you mentioned. What was his name? Tenant or Matt yeah, Smith? Yeah, Matt, yeah, yeah Ten, Tenant, Tenant's incredible. Tenant, Tenant, brilliant. Matt, yeah. Yeah. Matt Smith. Me, I don't know. <laughs> Tenet. I like. You know what's funny? I re I'm my favorite will always be Tenant. Um, but yeah, I thought he's great. I I liked a lot of Matt Smith's um his, the story and the writing for his episodes and his series. I thought were actually really well done. The whole oh, I forget exactly what it's called. It's been a, over a decade since I watched it, but when um the whole kind of recurring theme of the crack in the wall. Do you guys remember that? Yeah. And yeah, how? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. that was back when I still attempted to watch it. Yeah. Like I, think, I think I was very young when the ten when the tenant one came out. So I was like a a, a young teenager. So right. I watched that. I think with my with my parents, it was one of the things that we watched together. Nice. Still. nice. And then, yeah, oh, my parents would have never gone much after this. Tenet, well, my parents watched it as kids and it used right, to terrify right. them. Apparently, so oh, yeah, yeah, they the were like, yeah, well, it was scary classic, when it came the back. Classic stuff. The classic Doctor Who is like horrendously terrifying. Right. Because it wasn't because it wasn't aimed. It wasn't aimed at kids. It wasn't for yeah. kids. Right. But it would go on at a time. Where it would be like maybe people, maybe kids, maybe kids like sort of bedtimes, yeah. Mm -hmm. But they could still watch it, and if you're like, if you if your dad was a bit of a soft touch, be like, yeah, go on, you can watch it. Right. And it would just be like, like there was like one one with um the guy who played Wurzel Gummidge as a doctor, and he oh, was wow. like, yeah. he was he was brilliant at it, and it and he was like there was there was one where there was these creatures coming out of the sea, and he was they were all held up in a lighthouse, Ooh. and it was really terrifying. Sounds very like, Lovecraftian. Like, like they were just like stuck in a lighthouse, and there was these things coming out. Exactly, exactly. That's what Doctor Who should be. It should be eldritch horror. You mm. know, that's what it should be. Yeah. 
I would just, love an Eldritch love, Horror right. series. How cool would that be? Yeah, that'd be uh, so right. awesome. We got a little bit of, of that with um, Lovecraft Country, which um, is yeah. massively really underrated. Yeah, 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 it was really, really good. I love that. It was really good. And and the beautiful way it dealt with so yeah. many social issues of the time and, and mm. still, obviously, in the present um, was, was handled so well hand in hand you know yeah. and that became the true villain of the show rather than the eldritch mm. stuff going on was yeah. Yeah. how massively racist everybody is, yeah basically well yeah and, and lovecraft was massively racist so it was nice yeah. to see yeah, an adaptation of his work that sort of shone a light on that as well yeah. as the like actual eldritchy horror stuff right there was also the cabinet of curiosities on netflix which i is, watched mm, that yeah the guillermo really del toro stuff well, and that's all yeah all guillermo del toro doing lovecraftian-esque stuff some of them Esque, are yeah. direct ad- I, I, I i almost said direct adaptations that's not necessarily true they've taken the title of um dreams from the witch house and then done something oh right yeah, um, yeah but the the oh the story with the painting um that one's I really, really the cool. artist i really i really like that yeah um and i've not, yeah, I've not the... seen many many of them actually i need to watch they're them. they're pretty you, you good should. i mean not all good. of them are hits but i saw, I saw, I saw one anthology. with the, i saw one with the cream where the woman was getting younger oh, oh that yeah. is weird oh, that was that cream. Like, that, oh my god that, that, I, I love that sort of shit though that's yeah like, oh. that, that's kind of that's kind of like kind of like towards like requiem for a dream type sort of thing, right isn't it? yeah isn't exactly it? but like but like, but like I, I mean i don't like requiem for a dream obviously i know we spoke about that before that's like that's like the two that's the too far to it that, took it a little direction. too far right right yeah, yeah. That, in that direction yeah but, but um, i like the, I like that the rats oh uh, god the ra- remember the rats yeah, the episode the where they were in the, in the wall. No, oh, it was no, rats. So it's not based on, on it's that. like a grave digger who is trying to just loot corpses, basically. And um, the rats keep getting to all of his bodies first. So he hires like a rat catcher or something like that. And they go into these tunnels, and it turns out to be this massive network of these. Uh, and there's like a humongous rat in there. It's super creepy, super. Um, yeah what's the word claustrophobic yeah Yeah. because you're down in the tunnels and he's getting stuck in them and then he realizes he's got nowhere to go when he finally escapes and he's trapped and ultimately yeah it's it's messed up it's messed up but it's really cool oh god if you like if you like the cream stuff and and, well not the cream episode but if you like that kind of thing i think love death and robots or uh, sorry love is it love death yeah Yeah, love death and robots robots, Would yeah. be really, really good. I almost Some said love sex really and cool. robots, and I was like, no, that's not it. I think my, one of my one of my biggest fears is being buried alive. That's like a oh, then you need to watch yeah. the rat it's episode definitely chaos. <laughs> on Halloween. Yeah, that'll really, it's really you guys... ruin your sleep for a few days. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Have you guys um, have you guys ever heard of where uh, Saved by the Bell comes from? No, no. So, oh, they would bet rights. I, yeah, um, so, oh, fragmentally. Plague, tell, plague, tell, plague. tell the story. So basically, what it is 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 um, so in during the plague. And the, like, like, like the, te- like the nut was it the 1800s 1800s? Or whatever it was eighteen hundreds or whatever. No, lo- earlier than that. Earlier than that. Yeah, much earlier. Yeah, it was like yeah. ten sixty six or something ridiculous like that. They used to mm. basically they used to have um, they couldn't tell whether or not people were dead or not. So sometimes they would bury people and they'd still be alive. And what they used to do is they used to tie a string to their fingers, and then have the string go up from the grave to the top, and they'd have be like a post with a little bell mm. above their grave, and. Basically, if you woke up inside your grave, you would start scratching, you'd start clawing at your at your coffin, and that would then start pulling the string, which would then dingle the bell, right. which would alert, which would alert this man who would stand, who would sit there with a spade, and he'd be on what's called the graveyard shift. No, that's where, that's where the graveyard shift comes from. Ah, that's where the, awesome. where the bell comes from. So he would then yep. come and dig you out to make sure you're alive. So he'd basically be waiting for the bell. That's crazy. It's, it's amazing it. how much the bubonic plague, Black Death era gave us so many like modern oh, yeah. sayings, like the ring around the rosy nursery yeah, rhyme yeah, came yeah, from yeah. that and all of that. Jeez. I, I love I love that 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 time in history. That time yeah. in history and also um Jack the Ripper. Love Jack yep. the Ripper. Oh, oh my god. Oh, uh, if Leo and Nay were listening to this podcast, they'd tell you you need to play um Whitehall. And oh, uh, yeah, Whitehall is, it's a board is, is, game yeah. that oh, is okay. basically you as Scotland Yard trying to solve the or it, it's pre Scotland Yard, I think. But you're trying to solve Whitehall. the Jack the Ripper uh, oh, wow. cases. That yeah. right. And then there's, then, then there's like, like a sp- smaller version of it called Whitechapel, I think, mm. which is the I one think I play. It's like it's, it's the hidden movement game. So it's a little bit like Fury yeah. of Dracula. Yeah. You played Which Fury is also Dracula. a great game. I, you I, played Fury I, of yeah, Dracula. I, okay. I played it on my, yeah, my birthday. Uh, <laughs> Fear, fear of Fury, Dracula. Fury of Dracula. Fury. Fury of Dracula. Fury. Fury. 
no fury, fury as in anger. Oh, fury. He's so okay. angry. He's... <laughs> <laughs> so so Nay and Leo, two of our other DMs in Roll Dark, um, introduced me to this game. They had teased it the first time I hung out with them, and then when I came back earlier this year, we actually sat down to play it, and it is so much fun. It's so good. It's also so long. It takes it can take a long time, especially if you don't know what you're doing. But it is a fun and well produced and beautiful game and i was like i gotta buy this for myself i don't know who i'm gonna play it with but i gotta buy it for myself it's hard to find like i, I yeah buying it and there's yeah, just sold no. out everywhere they, they need to reprint oh YouTube. sad there's it's the, there's the italian version on amazon oh, that's, that's the thing. i don't know why they do that on amazon you can buy board games but then you'll <laughs> find <laughs> out <laughs> it's, it's all in it's all in italian all all in french and you're like well why have i when i've bought an english looking <laughs> listing on amazon.co.uk have i been sent a french version of a game <laughs> <laughs> it's happened to me it's happened yeah. to me twice which isn't a lot but it, it's weird this happened more than once <laughs> yeah right yeah the, the first way you the first part of learning to play the game is learning an entirely new language just add an yeah. extra difficulty level on top of things i, I mean listen so it's people, fun people and educational <laughs> Watching me try to l quickly learn the rules to any board game uh, on a board game night is extremely painful. Um, yeah. I've been told. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's not something that I'm very good at. I need days of advanced prep to learn games. Oh, we, I mean, we, there we is. Took, we took, we took a, it took us a day to learn Twilight Imperium. We literally yeah, sat down. That's, with like, I've got yeah, that. Like, that, that yeah. tracks. <laughs> I was like, oh my good God, this game is ridiculous. There is a digital version of it. I don't know how good that is. It's available on Steam and... Uh, Xbox, whatever they call it. I'm in the Microsoft. Yeah. I'm in called. the process with some of my players of uh, of organizing a date to finally play Twilight Imperium. Mm. Oh yeah, but um, I heard it's incredible. I've never played, it's, but it it's looks apparently like massive. amazing. It's great. It's yeah, great. you guys played Scythe before. You ever played Scythe? Yes, I've got I've played Scythe. Scythe. I've played it. Scythe's great. Scythe's lovely yeah. game. Yeah, brilliant artwork. The artwork's fantastic. I, I feel like I've mentioned this before, but I'm a huge Betrayal at House on the Hill fan. Um, oh, yeah. And I every time I hang out with people, I'm like, can we just, can we play more of this? Because I've only played about 25 scenarios and there are 80 in the book and I want to know them all. I want to yeah. figure out each one. But yeah. One day. One day. One day. <laughs> Maybe I'll, uh, when I, when I um, am there in late November for Roll Dark Fest, I'll rope all of you guys into doing a game night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? Anywho, yeah. so I guess yeah. back to the news. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, any uh, more news, James? Yeah. Um, there is a little. There is a little more. There are a couple of uh, Blade Runner tabletop RPG um, expansions coming out. Uh, one at the end of this year, and then one at the start of next year. So, um, the first one is called Case File Number Two: Fiery Angels. Um, and, in, and it is uh, an investigation uh, that starts off with Blade Runners assigned to question a suspect arrested while trying to infiltrate the Wallace Corporation memory vaults. Uh, the case cool. leads the team down a perilous path that explores the boundaries of replicant technology and its consequences. The player characters need to contend with an array of physical, mental, and moral challenges. Uh, though Fiery Angels is a standalone adventure, users who have played Case File 1 Electric Dreams will experience a continuation of story elements from that narrative. Um, I don't know if that's a direct continuation, but um, yeah. Okay. Cool. Very Maybe interesting. Take, take characters <coughs> over. Um, but the boxes that they're releasing with them will all contain a beautifully in illustrated uh, scenario book with locations, characters, events, uh, and leads to follow, plus a manila envelope containing around 20 different handouts, a uh, variety of in-world artifacts, and uh, Esper photos. Ooh, and that sounds cool. It does sound pretty cool. If yeah, and anything you can sort of give players to immerse them in the in the game world is my jam. So yeah, 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 I, love, yeah. I love a good handout. It is the the yeah. most seeing the look on people's faces when you get out uh, anything for them and start to pass it over. Mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah. it's Coming Christmas. Physical. Come early. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like. I, I bought a whole ream of parchment esque paper just for that reason for my printer when right. I was still running games right before the pandemic <laughs> in person, and then I got three weeks of that. Used it once, <laughs> and the pandemic hit. I was like, "Damn it!" Uh, so then, and also half a dozen, which is a fair amount of full color double sided maps. So, what, oh, great, nice, oh, nice. Lovely. That's really cool. Uh, and then the next expansion they're releasing next year is Replicant Rebellion. Um, so um, 
It will expand the scope of the core game, allowing players to join the ranks of the Replicant Underground in Los Angeles of 2037. Uh, characters are an independent cell loosely organized um, and undertake a variety of operations, helping fugitive Nexus 8 Replicants elude capture to sabotaging install, uh, installations of the Replicant industry. So there's an overview of the history and organization of the Replicant Underground, charting its presence throughout the entire Blade Runner timeline, so including the movies. Um, right. Detailed guidelines on how to play a Replicant um, Underground campaign and That's play cool. as a Replicant, um, including several new player character archetypes and half a dozen complete operations, uh, i.e. adventures to play for a cell in a Replicant Underground. Uh, yeah. Nice. So Sweet. Pretty, pretty yeah. interesting. That is a new for the. Uh, I've not tried the Blade Runner tabletop, but I know one of our DMs is has run. Mm. Um, yeah, Mike, the life Mike, of does, one, Mike does Mike. one one a month. Yeah, which is what's it called? Edge of Chaos? No, that's something uh, else. That's something um, else. That's actually um, that was a pod- that was the we, we talked yeah, about that it. That was a stream <laughs> that we did. We did this, that was a stream. It's um oh right uh, right Blade Runner. Uh, uh, it goes on website as a quick look. <laughs> <laughs> the Icarus Ascension. There's, I got you. there's a lot. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of games out there. To be fair, Blade <laughs> Runner: The Icarus Ascension. Very cool. Okay, sweet. Yeah. So um, nice one, James. Thanks so much for the news. So, do we have any updates from uh, games from this last week? This week at all, JC? Uh, uh, Tales from the Tables, we have uh, a very wonderful submission from Face, but due to time constraints, I'm going to let you um, just reach out to him directly if you'd like to hear it. It's a wonderful write-up. Get get the link from him. They're really, really good. Um, But I do have one myself, actually, from over the course of this past week, so that that I've been keen to share. Um, But maybe we should start with Jack. Because yours sounded a lot of like a lot of fun too. <laughs> yeah, we, we yeah. had a we had one of those incidents where the the players do something so extremely epic and and heroic that it totally destroys my prep for the whole rest of the game. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. So this is in our Keepers of Chaos campaign where things mm. are always really weird and there's a lot of odd odd moving parts, big random right. table of chaos rolls that where anything can really happen. Mm. How long? How long have you had that game going for, Jack? Ooh, about a year and a half or so, I'd say. Oh, now. Wow. that's pretty long yeah, running. We're, we're nice. Level we'll do eleven. A little, do a little shout out to your players. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. We've got a, quite a big revolving cast. I think there are nine of them that kind of nice. come in and out. Nice. Um, but yeah, we've shout out to the whole Keepers of Chaos crew. You're all absolutely awesome, even if you are oh. an absolute pain in my ass when you derail, <laughs> derail all of my things. Yeah, right. Um, so, um, so on this this section of the quest, the the chaos magic that has been kind of bouncing around the land and causing all kinds of problems, um, it's been somehow dripping into the river Styx and making its mm. way down into hell and having all sorts of horrible consequences to that so nice. to to get their way to the the section of the river they need to join on they they're going through a vampire nest and i had this awesome encounter set up there were three tunnels <laughs> that led to a kind of central chamber they mm. all arrive in the central chamber and it's like great perfect they're doing exactly what i think they're going to do they awoke the the kind of lead elder vampire and all of his little priestess minions Ooh. could bat for bat form and teleport themselves straight to the master's side. So I was going to have them all in, you know, the fighting the main guy in the center, the three pathways that come off it were going to have a priestess in, and I was just going to close in on them, surround yep. them, and just grind them down into a pulp. Nice. But nice. our paladin, Tove Skysnarl, played by the incredible Sean, um, rolled in a really high initiative, which, if you know our game, that is... Unbelievable. He's never rolled high initiative in the whole time. He is natural ones for initiative basically Oof. every time we play. It's Ouch. unbelievable. We've got a running James joke is nodding. He's like, yeah, yeah, I feel that. That's me all the time. Well, we have this running I'm, joke yeah. that he just struggles to get his sword out of its sheath and <laughs> drops it every time. Like, oh, oh, okay. But for once, he rolls extremely high and gets to go in before the, uh, the priestesses can be summoned to the master's side. Being a paladin, he walks right up to my boss monster 
and one shot kills the thing. No! It was something no. ridiculous, like, um, because he, he natural 20, he, did, he had all of his oh, extra paladin of effect. Course. And I think he did something like 145 points of damage across Jeez. his couple of swings. So he just, one turn, decimates my villain, destroys oh my, my tactics. God. The priestesses move in and they're just, they're penned into a corner <laughs> and just beaten to a pulp by the rest of the party. And oh I'm sat there God. like, well, this was one of the most epic things I've ever seen. What the hell do but I do, what do, I do now? now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Amazing. What level are they? Um, 11. Oh, oh yeah. Well, yeah, so paladins <laughs> are getting dangerous, but paladins yep. in natural 20s are getting even more ruthless. Divine uh, stacking smites at that level, plus your improved divine smite, which is just yep. radiant damage on every hit. When you crit, yeah, they're crit monsters. They could be dealing upwards of 100 damage a turn at that level for sure. It's it's dangerous, but I feel you. My, my uh, Wayfinders on Saturday, my team game, um, they are also right now fighting a vampire boss that they've been kind of um, dealing with for quite some time. And I think in one and a half rounds of combat, they're level 16, but I added a ton of vampire spawn, but they all rolled terrible initiative. Um, so they, they didn't get to really interfere with what the party was doing until the end of the round. But they got up to her. She's um, She's a character from the Ravenloft setting. She is called... Uh, Alcio Metis posing as Baron Metis and uh, she kind of runs a secret organization an evil coven of vampires in Darkon which is one of the worlds of the Ravenloft setting anyway um, they got her down from like 150 to like I, I shouldn't say the number in case any of the Wayfinders are listening, but 20-something. Yeah, yeah, right. 20-something. Okay, so, so. And it, we haven't quite finished the combat yet, but I was like she's had she's been able to cast two spells and done almost nothing else and i gave her all kinds of cool magic items she has one of the flying swords so finally she was like all right she's just going to cast greater invisibility and try and run away from the party at this point so that's where we're at they're still dealing with it but they're close they're real close and now they're like throwing aoe's everywhere to sort of see if she's in that corner of the room or in this other corner of the room she was in a huge like sauna bathing in a blood tub the whole time nice yeah she's she's a she's a right psychopathic creature <laughs> yeah the best ones are the best ones yeah are. exactly yeah no anyway jack ophelia that's epic though yeah mm. great great fun but yeah really really problematic i managed to extend it a little bit by um there was one of the vampires kind of thralls that was very recently changed and still was a little bit unsure about his uh oh god i'm a vampire now but he's all about career progression his name nice. is Jeff. But if I get a career as a vampire, I've got a long time there where I'm, I'm undead now. I can make my way up the ranks. Um, he refers to himself as Demighty Jeff. Welcome oh, to my lair. Jeff. I am Demighty Jeff. <laughs> uh, so the, the Mighty Jeff pleaded for his life with the paladin and effectively yeah. said, uh, I will swear myself into your servitude instead of the servitude of this, this vampire monster if mm. you spare my life. Um, ah, he's nice. still grappling with the morality of that, but the the mighty Jeff lives on. For the time being. Are you kidding? When he sounds like that, of course you say. That yes. was it. Yeah, <laughs> it's when the whole party started to laugh at him. It was like, okay, we're keeping this one, are we? Great. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been watching a lot of what we do in the shadows, and he's kind of reminding yeah, me a bit that, of Mandor. I've been watching it at the time, and I think it just bled <laughs> straight into. I didn't realize till after the yeah. session, I was like, oh damn, that is. I've just what we do in the shadows. My my horror <laughs> level and turned it into a comedy. Yeah, right. that's. I had just started that show when I was doing the end of a Strahd campaign and I couldn't help myself. This was my home game. I couldn't help myself. It was a super epic fight, high stakes. They were giving it their all. They had all these awesome magic items, but Strahd was so strong and they were at the top of the rooftops on Ravenloft. And I was like, oh God, he's got to flee because otherwise he's going to get really boned by that sun sword. And he just goes, Bat! And <laughs> it turns into a bat and it flies away but i couldn't i couldn't not say it because it was in my brain because of laszlo bat bat brilliant. gosh oh, brilliant brilliant Anywho. so did you start off with your players jack when you first um had your players were they all uh beginners with Roldark? Um, there was a couple of beginners. I think a couple of them had done a, a few games before. We've we picked up a few new players along the way. Um, yeah. You know, kind of dropped a couple, moved in and out, depending on people's schedules. But yeah, they, 
I think we, we started off, it was just a one shot that kind of has spiraled out of control into <laughs> to where we are now. Right. Um, but we've got one one of them from that one shot has played every single game for wow. the entirety of it. And is, Whoa. is always there. There, are, there, there should Goliath be a prize for that, you know? <laughs> yeah, there really should be. Yeah, shout yeah, out I always feel like inspiration is just not enough for... Because I, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm very liberal with inspiration. I love to give inspiration to my players when they do something really cool or when they, they play to their their flaws their weaknesses their bonds whatever but um sometimes the role play just dials it up to 11 or they do something out of character like attend every session for such a long stretch of time that you feel like yeah i could give them a magic item that's super cool or ask them what they want but like i feel like it's not enough like i wish there was something more i could do maybe an epic boon or something like that you know but then Mm. how do you balance it because you know if they're level five you don't want to give them an epic boon just yet yeah so yeah. yeah right yeah okay yeah. cool so so on the on so have you seen like um your players go through like a real journey in terms of like their knowledge of D and how they th- how they make the characters think and yeah how they absolutely yeah. there's been i mean the character arcs from the mall are, are so amazing watching this development of the mall and all the little relationships and interplay between all of the, the members of the group it's it's yeah. just so so epic like a few of mm. them have, have got this um kind of sibling rivalry type relationships going on and they're always trying to one up each other and Brilliant. now whenever we kill anything they harvest every single piece of it that they can because <laughs> oh we take God. it we take it back to the the keep of chaos and they make their own items out of it so we oh, that's cool kind of, um that we killed a morkoth in a um, oh, I love two morkoth. shot not long ago and yeah. the, the beak of the morkoth has been turned into kind of magical knuckle dusters for the monk nice um, oh wow and, We've got someone with um, <laughs> tentacle gloves that use the suckers for spider climb. That's um, awesome. So, so oh, they've, that's really they've cool. fully started just, oh just harvesting God. everything. Oh, and then oh between campaigns, they'll write a list of, okay, this is what we got. What yep. are we going to build out of all this stuff? <laughs> so they, they, the first session of every, every wow. new campaign arc is just them going, right, I'm going to try and build this. I'm going to try and make this thing next. I want this Brilliant. over here. So, nice. yeah, we could we could probably write a full book of, of homebrewed items that they've just come up with themselves over the last wow. like, eleven levels. Yeah. And how how I was use, that um... first instigated? Sorry, sorry, JC. How, yeah, was yeah, that yeah. First, how was that first instigated amongst your players then with them creating these things? So we we have an incredible um, blade sing um, blade singing dragonborn uh, wizard who right. is. Um, their kind of entire goal in life is to build a a monstiary that is more detailed and more accurate than what Volo has managed to make. Ah, that's like that's their, cool. their rival. It's a great goal. <laughs> really great goal. So they were always studying, kind of taking notes on whatever we encountered and whatever we killed. But then then they they went off and and kind of homebrewed up what would be a pathologist's kit by googling what was what was in what a pathologist would normally have. Um, Oh, wow. So from there, that kind of mechanic just spun out a little bit of, of, God, can I use my pathologist kit to to cut that chunk off? And like, what properties (laughs) does that have? Well, well, I guess it would have this, this, and this. Oh, right. So if I roll a high enough check, would I be able to fashion that into something new? Oh, hell yeah. Mm. Let's let's see what happens. Like, it's chaos campaign. You can make whatever the hell you want. It's not going to be as weird as what I'm throwing at you. So so let's go. (laughs) Nice. I've only dabbled with that kind of stuff, but I use, um, there's an awesome resource out there called, I'm sure you've heard of it, Haman's Handy, I think it's Haversack or something like that, or or something of the yeah. sort. Um, but it's basically, yeah, I loot the creature, what what do I find? And they provide you all kinds of resources yes. for all every every creature in the monster manual, and then the expansions have Volo's Guide to Monsters and Morden Canons as well. Oh, wow, that's and, good. Oh, it's what's really it, what's good. What's it called? What's it called? Hammond's, I, th- I want to say Hammond's Handy Haversack, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure that it's Haversack. Now, I, I might just be getting that confused with the item in the game. Um, I can look it up in a second, because I have it buried <laughs> when, in one when, of my when, files. When a player loots, when a player character loots, say... Um, another uh, like a, a monster or like i don't know like a person they've killed or whatever um when they roll a natural one do you or, or first of all do you, do you make them roll an investigation check for them to loot or do you just let them just go through their pockets i usually make them make them check to see to see yeah. how, how cool it is because i think it's nice okay. if they do get like a natural 20 to be like oh cool i'll give you something awesome here mm-hmm. yeah, yeah that, sure. make that 20 feel special or if they get a get a one, it could be oh you reach into their pocket and there's a loaded mouse trap in there. Like take a couple right. of oh, okay, of damage sweet. so you can oh, okay, swing it both idea. ways. 
Yeah, yeah. that's a good idea. Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. And how do you guys come up with these? Do you just like have like a, a repertoire of what you go through in your mind or do you have like a list or what do you do? I usually just make it up on the fly. Um, yeah. See what whatever they've killed, see what kind of comes, what, what, what might they have on them if they've been using a weapon, mm. you know, that's probably there. Or, you know, with the vampires, it was, you can take their teeth and a pile of dust. That's all that's left. After <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah, right. Right. Now we have uh, one of our rogues trying to make a, uh, like a poison out of the vampire dust. Um, oh, wow. Oh, interesting. Wanting to make okay. things out of the teeth that can, their plan oh, is to make yeah. the teeth kind of sap HP if they can use them for an attack, right? To try and oh, get wow. get some of the get some healing back if yeah. they if they use the teeth. So wow. you know, they they come up with such good stuff that I now just give them like a couple of tools that I know they're going to run off and, and play with, do their own thing. Yeah, yep. <laughs> just sit back and let Brilliant. them w- watch for an hour while they do right. all sorts of awesome experiments. I That's found great. the the resource that I was using, and it was not Handy Haversack. It was Haman's Harvesting Handbook. That's it. A oh, guide well, to okay. harvesting and crafting in D anD D five e, and yeah, they have something for every monster here. This is this is a great resource, but yeah, I've totally done the same. Um, I've off the cuff been like not had this on me, and they were like, "So you know, what what, what can we salvage from this here?" And I'm like, "Well, it's got horns and scales, and yeah, the other proliferation of claws, and can we get a lightning sack from its throat?" And I'm like. Yes. Yes, yeah. you can. Great. Can I can I make a a lightning rail gun using a combination of its horns and the and the lightning sack and mount it onto this sort of crossbow base that I have? I'm like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow. Yeah, a lot of the times the players will lead you into what they in their minds have decided they yeah. can do with the body of the creature, oh, yeah, <laughs> and you're just right. like, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, that's that makes sense. Like, oh, okay. A lot of it is just, can I take its skin and whatever resistance it has, can I then create that into armor or a shield? Yeah, or yeah, that, that's Sorry, a common one. Yep. Yeah. Or wow. can I make it into a shield or something like that if mm. it's like a carapace? Yep. Yeah. I, I, ma- I, ma- I imagine, Jack, being a DM must be like just sheer creative fuel for your writing career. Oh, yeah. I, I always call it the, the storytelling gym. It's like going and doing yeah, reps right. and lifting weights because, you know, you can plan a plan an idea, plan a story, and then nice. suddenly you get the players and um, in the chaos game, the chaos table, and all of a sudden you're telling a totally different story to the one that you planned on. But you you know rolling with those kind of punches, I think, just makes you a more dynamic storyteller, just generally, and mm. definitely helps me writing movies afterwards. Yeah, great. For so, sure. but, so as a, as a writer, then when you prep your games, how do you how do you prep? Do you prep like do you have like a like a a set in stone sort of method that you do or is it is it always different well how do you how do you approach it um it, it kind of varies to be honest with you sometimes it's, if it's a kind of a new campaign or a, or a one shot or something like that it'll just come from a okay this seems like a great idea i know i can do something really fun with this whether it's a mechanic or a character or some kind of plot hook and then mm. you know lay that down and the players will inevitably change that straight away but as you start kind of moving forward through the campaigns like with the keepers of chaos there's almost no point in planning too far ahead of them because they will yeah, right. they will do something absolutely insane to, to change the yeah, shape yeah, of the yeah. game. Sure. So it's kind of rolling with the punches a little bit and, and the things that they come up with and the things that they say and the interactions that they have, just keeping a running list of kind of inspiration ideas for me. Like, oh, they talked to this yeah. guy. They had a weird encounter with this thing over here. Like, I wonder what that could be. Can I link that to that and link that to that? And then all of a sudden the picture starts to build and characters that I thought were just kind of, well, even just improvised NPCs, they just start chatting to somebody, and all of a mm. sudden something will happen in that improv, and it's got on my little note list, and it'll come back round six weeks later kind of thing as the, oh, yeah, he was a bad guy the whole time. Like, I didn't know it at mm. the time, so you couldn't possibly have known it at the time. Yeah, right. But he has been, and I think it just turns into trying to stay one lesson ahead of the class. It's like real substitute teacher vibes, <laughs> trying to figure out what yeah. comes next. <laughs> Yeah, right. And when and when you plan games, like if you're planning like a campaign or whatnot, do you build your setting first or do you have a story in place first? Like how do you approach that? Um, it's kind of either or to be honest with you. A lot of the time it is is story first, because that's just the, the game I'm used to used to playing. But sometimes almost the same with, with the screenwriting stuff, sometimes a a a world, a, a city, a a place will grow before any character or story does. 
and then you can yeah. dive into that and start to play in your own sandbox realistically so yeah it just you know you never know where where the idea will come from it's just catching right. them catching them as they swim by yeah right we were talk we were talking before we started um, recording as well about um how sort of settings can have their own alignment as well Ooh. which i thought was really interesting did you mind just sort of just explain a bit more about that yeah i i saw this on on reddit last night um and I found it really fascinating because obviously characters have all got their their alignments, you know, chaotic evil, lawful good, and all all that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but this is a table of alignment of stories and settings, which I thought was really interesting because I've never, mm. you know, I mean, when we were talking pre pod, we were kind of saying that the the setting will reflect the theme and the the alignment, so to speak, of the game that you're playing, but often the the setting will be a direct response to the things that are inside the game. So, you know, yeah. we're running a really grim, evil horror story. You, you'll end up in a dark to grim, dark kind of setting and build your world to reflect that. But right. I thought from a kind of straight world building perspective, approaching it with the world's alignment at the start is a really interesting concept. So this is what mm. they, they had. Um, so you'd start with noble, bright, world worth saving, characters able to step up and do it. Um, Bright world uh, presents a world where most people are decent and society as a whole is positive. Um, mm. Grim bright, the world is a good place that ought to be maintained, but doing so is an uphill battle. Heroes mm. suffer and die so peace can be maintained. So mm. next layer Grim down. bright. That's Grim cool. bright. Mm. Yeah, it's really cool. Really cool concept. Grim bright. Yeah. Um, then you've got noble. Um, believe in the power of individuals to change their world for the better through heroics. True neutral doesn't take on any of those. Um, it might straddle the line between them, but it gives you kind of varied and unlimited possibilities because it can go wherever, wherever any it needs which to way, go. Sure, um, sure. Then grim, accomplishment is fleeting, and even those momentary gains are only achieved through pain and suffering on behalf of the characters. Wow. <laughs> um, then your final level, um, noble dark. The world's a pretty bad place, but good people trying hard enough can save it. There's a lot of ground to cover and a lot of difficulty in doing that, but it is a, a possibility. Um, then you've got your dark world and uh, presents a world that is essentially negative and the people in society who are corrupt or bad, a world that needs to be changed. Mm, wow. Finally, into grimdark. The world is terrible and so are your chances of doing anything about it. <laughs> yeah. so basically reality right yeah right yeah, yeah. <laughs> we live in a grim dark like, like, dystopian yeah. society currently i really like the idea of grim bright I, I, but my immediate thought when you said grim bright and you sort of explained what it was would be the world of harry potter i thought would be like a grim bright kind of place mm. because because yeah. it's because it is quite bright but there's a lot of but it can easily fall to the dark with there like is the whole evil outside yeah the, yeah right. Yeah. Any other ideas? What you could have as grim, as grim bright? I'm thinking of anything like where you've got a city or or an area that is a utopia, but then from the outside, there's things coming in trying to attack them. And yeah. I know there's examples of that, and they have all left my brain. <laughs> <laughs> on, a, on a very, very yeah. micro level, it reminds me, obviously, talking about BG3. So, spoilers for anyone who's not in well into Act Two, but um, Jack, you don't mind, do you? No, no. I've okay. got all the spoilers all right. have been on the table for me for it's, so it's long. It's a light spoiler. To avoid them. <laughs> effectively, because you know it from Act One, Act Two is a, a shadow cursed area. It's very Shadow Fell inspired, and. The last light in is a literal beacon of hope in the center of this. And there's a shield of light around the inn, which is keeping back the shadows and the dark. So it would be oh, like wow. kind of running. That's on a very, very micro level, obviously. Yeah. But it would be you running and having adventures in there while having to make maybe forays out into the darker world beyond and uh, in order to keep the shield up or keep the light yeah. going and that kind of stuff. I feel like that's what a grim bright. Maybe Destin, I think be. Destiny may be the one that I was thinking of where they had never, I realized I've, humanity I've never got into like, Destiny. Uh, it's been a while. But they have mm. the um the like the home base you have for the traveller and that is trying right, to power right. the evil around it. But I I to be fair, it may it's probably not a utopia um in in the centre of the society either. But it's sort of nicer there and everything outside is outside of the safe zone is is awful. Mm. Um Hmm, cool. I yeah, I would love to like get this list and then try and think through existing IPs and, and worlds and properties that would match to this. Like which one is the Mass Effect world? That feels like it's a 
like a noble bright maybe i'm not i'm not quite mm-hmm. sure similar to star trek but then what is what is the lord of the rings because that's all over the place that's probably a neutral setting ish depending on the age i guess but yeah you could yeah. you could attach different sort of stories and and ips and stuff to see which one's mm. which that'd be kind of a cool exercise say, yeah grim grim sure. dark uh, uh, maybe game of thrones but even then uh, there's some bright spots there. <laughs> yeah everything, uh, everything is, is screwed and everything you do in it is also screwed <laughs> yeah. and at the end of yeah. the day no matter what you do you're all basically screwed, screwed. Um, while, while everyone's screwing yeah, yeah while everyone <laughs> yeah. is literally Screw squared. Squared. <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing what's God. going down cool well um any other anything else to add to this episode i i have an Ooh. am i the asshole question oh okay to the am I the wait is this a personal oh. thing not a, <laughs> not a rpg horror story thing? the answer is uh, yes james <laughs> no it's not it's not from one of my games uh, but oh, they right, okay. <laughs> uh and it's a player asking if they've done the wrong thing at their table and i'd be interested to see as as dms what what we think so uh table the the story is uh am i the arsehole Ru- rules lawyer me caused the party to fail yes then. okay <laughs> well, okay <laughs> uh, i'm that kid who reminded the teacher we had homework we were infiltrating a castle to steal a rare relic and rather than fight our way through the castle we decided to cast fly on the ranger who would sneak in to steal it Nice. There were too many. There were too many enemies inside, so the ranger came out and suggested we create a diversion. When he went back in, it worked. We drew out most of them who engaged us in a fight. The ranger stole the item and was flying back when the wizard failed to hold person from an enemy inquisitor. Mm, that's when I said, see where this is going." That's when I said, "Don't forget, fly ends because paralyzed breaks a concentration." Groans yeah. around the table. Really? You had to say that? The ranger fell 50 feet right in front of a dozen guards who saw him with the relic. He was promptly captured and taken back into the castle. And then we ended the session. (laughs) Afterwards, Hmm. the DM private messaged me, hey, you probably had good intentions, but I was aware of par- I was aware that paralyzed ended flying. I conveniently let it slide because I wanted you guys to succeed and you were so close. But after you said it, I couldn't ignore it. Right. Another player private messaged me less nicely to say, Hey dude, can you just keep your mouth shut next time? <laughs> <laughs> In my defense, if we had, if we had to cheat to win, it feels like an undeserved success. That's true. Yeah. Um yeah. So there were a couple of edits to it. So it, the first one was a DM's response to uh on hold person. I cast hold person to add the feeling of stress to the situation. I was expecting the wizard to counterspell it. If I knew he ran out of spell slots, I absolutely wouldn't have cast a spell that would break concentration. That was my fault. Uh, she, he then said he showed this post and this story to the player. as a poll at the bottom of it as well. Um, the player who told me to shut up has just left the game. <laughs> Whoa. Um, so, yeah, yeah, you know what? That tracks. That uh, seems exactly the, like what somebody like that would do. The options for what he should have done. Uh, or or your reaction to it. So I would have done the same thing as as OP uh, and said something. I would have ignored it, but private messaged the DM to be like, hey, what's going on here? Uh, three, I would have ignored it. Or four, I would have done something other than any of those options. Um, the over, Now, I know, I, I say what, I won't tell you the overwhelming uh, response to this. Before Majority. I get your, yeah, yeah, before I get your responses. What, what would you have done as a as a player and then as a DM in that situation, do you think? I think it might say a lot about the way I, I run my games, but as a DM, I would have been delighted to be reminded <laughs> that they're about to get put into a really, yep. really terrible yep. situation that I can use, <laughs> use to my own benefit for other games. Um, and you don't even have to take responsibility for Yeah, well, yeah, I'm not oh, the bad I, guy. <laughs> I'd, I'd have totally missed that, but like, he's right. No, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I have a lot of thoughts about this. Um, yeah. First of all, the only asshole in this situation, in my opinion, is the player who left. Yeah, that's I, that's how I feel. If you if you are messaging players in between sessions to tell them to keep their mouth shut, you don't really have a place in my games um, because I'm trying to build camaraderie most of the time. Yeah, right. and and I especially not on a private level. Like if it's a joke in the game, like oh my god, why'd you have to say anything? You ass. Mm. Fine. 
but not in between sessions and not that serious. And if it bothers you enough that rather than rolling with the punches and seeing where this new cool story develops, it, it goes from a heist to a jailbreak at this point now, right? It's changed the the dynamic of the tale. Um, and you're not in for it and you leave the game, then you never had a place at the table, right? Like, have fun. Bye. Don't let the door hit you on the way out, basically. Yeah, um right. I always try and be respectful of how the fact, you know, that everybody f wants something different out of D and D, and maybe they're like super optimized and they want things to go exactly according to plan. But you have to understand that D and D isn't like that, and the, the introduction of chaos that other players bring will always change the dynamic of a game. So you have to be flexible, and you have to understand. Just like I learned when I rolled the dice for the first time and i thought i'd ruin the game the game was over but the game continues like it's not over mm -hmm. it just changes it just means the dm has more work to do at this point because they have to make a scenario in which rescuing the ranger is feasible you know or unless it's a grimdark world in which the ranger's screwed and then they roll up yeah, a new right. character that will also probably die in a few sessions i don't know yes <laughs> but yeah as a as a dm it's hard to say because I don't know the whole stakes and the scenario and stuff. But I mean, if they had a person who logically could cast hold person and mm. and, you know, they have like magical defenses for this place, then, yeah, they should use it. Right. Like there's there's yeah. stakes. It's, it's going to be difficult if it's more of like a beer and pretzels game. And it's just like a fun romp. Maybe I wouldn't have put a mage in there that has that level of a spell. But I don't know if it's a serious campaign and this was a serious object that has a lot of value to the story, then yeah, of course I'd have it well defended as a player. Yeah. I think what he said at the end, it, it doesn't really count as a victory if you cheat because D and D is a, it's still a game. It's a cooperative storytelling game, right? But at the end of the day, there are mechanics that we have to observe. Otherwise it loses the game element of it. And for that matter, we could just sit around a campfire and, talk to each other and build up a story as we go like an mm -hmm. improv game but because it's a game and there are chances of success and failure and there are mechanics we have to go into yeah i've had plenty of people remind me all the time about how things work even and i've done the exact same thing i've sort of let things slide like you know they really need to get out of a bad situation and they need to cast misty step but they've already cast a leveled spell that turn sometimes they'll be like oh yeah conveniently i forgot that you can't cast two leveled spells and they move out just to sort of give them the chances but if someone reminds me and i'd be like oh yep he's right that's right you you failed your concentration check the ranger falls 50 feet and here's the 5d6 <laughs> so yeah it's just the way it is right it's just, it's just like, the way it you is know, yeah, you just got to roll with the punches. And if that's the decision mm -hmm. that gets made, if the player decides to tell you, then that's the way it goes. You go, okay, great. Thanks for telling me no. Here we go. Because at the end of the day, you are also a player. Even though you're a DM, yep. you are still playing the game, yep. right? And it's, it all, you, do you know what I mean? And it's, it's that, that often gets lost among the players. They don't mm -hmm. seem to really, they just think that you're there for their purpose, which I guess in a way you are, but at the same time- But you're also there to play. You are doing Yeah, exactly. Both. In order yeah. for the game to actually be good and be fun, right. the DM work, has to yeah. be, and to work, the DM has to be the DM. Right. It has to have like all the tools available to them. And if you, want to, if you forget something and a player reminds you, that's great that's for you. Bonus. Because that's how yeah. you are playing the game. Yeah. In our Wave Hunters game, we have a, one of our players is a teacher's pet, and they constantly tell that player, don't teacher's pet. Don't you dare teacher's pet. They're like, JC, <laughs> you're forgetting about this element that, that would have been. And it's never about it like a spell. It's something far more significant to like the story or, or the situation or the scenario. They're like, <laughs> actually, that guy would have a, a this sword because he stole it from us six sessions ago. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right. Yep, let's do that. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, but that's, but that's part of Love like... That. That's great. Like that's yeah, it's, help, that's, it's that's, help, that's helpful and brilliant. Yeah, exactly. It's it's I'm great sure that they, they like it. With yeah. your story as well, they're remembering stuff like how he that guy stole a sword from us six sessions ago. That's that's a long time to remember something that. Yeah, totally. Yep. Theoretically. Oh yeah. The, well, <laughs> the brains of teens are far more are far better at, at memorizing and remembering little details than mine could ever yeah. be. So yeah. yeah. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Well, thanks everyone for joining us for this week's podcast and uh, tune in for next week. So yeah, we're going to say goodbye here because we've gone to what, an hour and 20? Oh wow, already. Yep. Yeah, we're yeah. almost at an hour got, and a half. I've got, I've, got, I've, got a lunch, I've got a lunch to eat somewhere. 
<laughs> so I've got a game that starts in an hour and 20 minutes. So. Oh, shoot. Shit. Yeah, you got to get ready. Yeah, I haven't prepped yet. <laughs> nah, it's all prep. It's all prep. Rob, do you have lunch or is it a lunch simulator? It's a lunch simulator. <laughs> it's a lunch simulator. I, I, literally, I, I literally have to play a game where I like, make a sandwich. Then I have to go like get a yogurt from the fridge. But then like I find out that my partner's ate the yogurt that I bought her yep. and me. She had both of them. Then I've got to like go and kick off to her, but I can't kick off because, yeah, yeah it's, 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 <laughs> ugh, life, life similar. Yep, life. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks cool. ever so much. Yeah. Cheers, Thanks everybody. Bye bye. Thanks, bye. Jack.